So there are a lot of things that are said over here. First of all, how old was Avraham when Hashem told him to go from Horan, from Ur Kastim, to Canaan? 70? 70. 75. 75. There's a debate that there's an opinion that says he went the first time when he was 70. Mm -hmm. And he went with Lot, and then he came back, and then Hashem oh. told him to go when he was 75. We'll talk a little bit about that. They say that the gematria, the value of Lech Lecha, is 50 and 50 is 100. So Hashem said to him, if you go, I promise you 100 more years. He left when he was 75. We know that Aram Avinu lived 175 years. So that's where they talk about the word Lech Lecha. But let's begin. He goes to Eretz Canaan, and he travels through the land. He goes to Shechem, and Elon Moreh. And then there's a hunger. One of the other tests. There's a ra'av, a hunger. So what does that force him to do? He works his way south until he goes to Egypt. And then he's in Egypt, and we have the whole situation with Paro. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, Vayal Avrami Mitzrayim, when Avram left Mitzrayim, Hu v'yishto v'chol ha'shelo v'lo t'imo ha'negbo, they went back again towards now north. Avram was very heavily weighed with cattle, sheep, goats, camels, horses, silver, gold. He was quite wealthy. And he went back and he retraced his steps. That's what Rashi says. Rashi says every place that he stayed on the way down, that's the place he stayed on the way back. Which is very unusual, because on the way down, Abraham had very little money, and he could afford very little. So there are chances that sometimes he didn't even stay in a hotel, and if he did stay in a hotel, he stayed in a very broken down, very poor hotel, cheap, cheap one, very cheap one. Now he's multimillionaire. So why is he staying in a cheap hotel? It, it no longer behooves him. No longer is. His cover, it, it, it seems to take away from his cover. So they bring down a story from Reb Shmuel Kamenetsky. Reb Shmuel Kamenetsky is the Rosh Hashiva in Philadelphia. He was the son, he's the son of Reb Yaakov Kamenetsky, and Reb Shmuel Kamenetsky now is probably in his 90s. And for years and years and years, he traveled to Toronto, where he stayed in different homes to collect money for the yeshiva. Now, you have to appreciate that when he went to Toronto 30, 40 years ago, he stayed in different people's homes. Over the course of time, his own children, some of them got married, and some of them moved to Toronto. So now when he came to Toronto, logic, everybody assumed, where would he stay? By his children. At least spend Shabbos with his children, with his grandchildren. He's in Toronto, he's in the city, from Philadelphia. So they say that in spite of the fact that his children were there, he always went back to the places he stayed before. And when they asked him why, he says, I learned it from Avraham Avinu. Mm -hmm. Avraham Avinu did the same thing. <laughs> On the way back, he went to the places he stayed before. The, the Oznaim La Torah, Reb Zalman Sarbatskin, he says as follows. He says that on the way down, Avraham Avinu was busy telling people all about Hashem. He would come to the hotel at night, he would make a bracha. People would say, what are you doing? You're making a bracha. What does that mean? I'm blessing God. Who is God? Well, he made the heavens, the earth, the water, the clouds. He helped produce the bread, everything. So he would say, you know, well, where did you discover this God? Well, I discovered him back in Ur Kasli when I was thrown into the fiery furnace, and I survived. And then he would say, so what are you doing here? Hashem told me to come. Why? He promised me I'd be wealthy and I'd be successful. So then he said to him, okay, where's your wealth? Where's your success? He says, well, it hasn't happened yet. Aha. Uh -huh. So your God promised you all these things and nothing happened. So people did not embrace Hashem. Because it was talk. Now that Avram came back from Mitzrayim and he was very wealthy and successful, he went right back to the same places to show the people, I told you about God, I said he would deliver, look, he delivered. So it was very important for Abraham not to stay at the Waldorf Astoria 
or the Hilton Hotel, but to go back to the places he stayed. The Ksav Sofer gives a different answer. He says when a person is poor, he's friendly with a certain level, a certain class of people. When a person becomes wealthy, he now associates with a different class. He no longer talks to the people he originally knew. Avraham Avinu did not want that. Avraham Avinu says, I talk to everybody. Whether I was poor or I was rich, I'm still friends with everybody. So he went back to the same places to show that he talks to everybody and he's involved with everybody. Bless you. You know, they, they, they bring down the question, it's a, an old question. When it came to Saddam, Avraham said, I'm not taking any money. When it came to Pyro, he took a lot of money. Why? So one answer, of course, is Ma'asel avot simulabanim. He wanted to show that one day the Jews will leave Egypt, also with a lot of money. So I have to set the precedent. If I leave with a lot of money, and I'm just one person, then I expect every Jew to walk out with the same amount of money. From Sodom, there was no future. Sodom was going to get destroyed. There was no future in Sodom, so it made no difference. But another answer that they give is very simple. When Avraham went down to Mitzrayim, he had no money. So every place he stayed, he told the people, I owe you money. When you owe a person money, and someone offers you a gift, some money, you know what you're supposed to do? You take it. Why? Because you have debts. You no longer have the luxury to say, no, it's okay, I'm going to do it for free. No, you can't do it for free. You owe people money. When you owe people money, and you do a job for somebody, and they offer to pay you, you have to take the payment. If you're rich, you can say, I don't want. If you don't owe anybody any money, you can do what you want. You know, you know, someone comes to you and says to you, I have to give ma'aser, but I also owe people money. What should I do first? What's the answer? Pay back the people you owe. But tzedakah, yeah, you're right, tzedakah is important. But paying back the people you owe is also important. That means there's a certain way of conducting yourself, and that's very important to know. Okay. Avram and Lot were brother-in-laws, uncle and nephew. But at the same time, they got into a problem. Not so much Avram and Lot, but the shepherds of Avram, the shepherds of Lot. It's interesting, the Medrash says that Lot looked very much like Avraham. You could almost not recognize the difference between them. You could get confused. So Avram was afraid that if Lot acts a certain way, people might see it and think it was him. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. The problem was not that he was doing what he was doing. That he could distance himself from. But the confusion caused by people thinking, Avraham did this, that he could not excuse. At any rate, Rav Dessler says that Avraham was held responsible a little bit for what happened to Lot. He says, sometimes matters of principle becomes a matter of personal. What begins with, I don't have anything against you, it's the principle. But in short time, what does it become? Personal. It affects how, how people live. They bring down a story from the Gomorrah and Brochos. Gomorrah Brochos says that Rabbi Gamliel wanted to organize the Sidur, the Shemona Esrei. How many blessings in Shemona Esrei? Nineteen. Nineteen. Originally, there was eighteen. Hence the name Shemona Esrei. Who wrote the 18 brachot? Shimon Hapikuli. A guy named Shimon Hapikuli. Then they decided that they're going to put in an extra bracha, a number 19 bracha, called Velam al Shinim. All those people who try to destroy Torah, they should get destroyed. It's not the regular bracha. It's not, you gave us Chachma, Atochon Elondas. It's not like, Rifo Enu Hashem Venerofei, cure our illnesses. This was not a brocha as much as a klala, a curse. Protection. Protection and a curse. So now, who should Rabbi Gamliel have asked to make this 19th brocha? Shimon sure. Apikuli. He did, the, he did the first 18. He doesn't. The Gemara says he went to Shmuel HaKatan. That was his name, the small Shmuel. Shmuel HaKatan. So there's a sefer, Birkas Hamini. There's a sefer by Rishul Raf on the Birka Samini, and he says, why? Why did he go to Shmuel HaKatan? What was wrong with Shimon HaPikuli? So he says, you know, Shmuel HaKatan once said, when your enemy falls, don't be happy. So 
Rabbi Gamliel says, if I'm going to make a bracha that curses my enemies, I want the person who writes the bracha to be the same person who said, when your enemies fall, don't be happy. Mm-hmm. That means, I understand it's necessary. I understand we have to do this. But, but, sometimes, even when you have to do things that are unpleasant, you have to do it in a way where you at least are not smiling because of it. So he didn't want Shimon HaPikuli to do it. He handpicked Shmuel HaKatan to write that book. Call from one, three, okay. four, seven. Very interesting. Let's go a little bit further. Then I want to tell you something very interesting. Okay? But uh, let's go a little bit further. It says as follows. Uh, I'll share it with you. I want to share this with you. We all know what's going on in Israel. Yes. And we all know that there's these terrorist attacks, mostly by knife, violent attacks. There have been something like 10 Jews that have been killed, 12 Jews that have been killed. And over the last two or three weeks, people have come over to me and people have asked me, you know, why is this happening? What can we do to stop it? What's the solution? So why is this happening? We don't have an answer for, of course. What we can do to stop it, there's the usual answers. You can do teshuva, tefillah, tzedakah, chesed. Um, you can try to adopt maybe the attitudes of, of some of those who felt that the, the Jews and the Arabs have to be totally separate. There's no possible peace. There are a lot of different solutions. I was speaking to a, a Rav, and I guess there was someone from either Zaka or he had overheard, or one of the Israeli politicians. And it gives you an idea how we don't understand the world at all. I'm going to tell you something that I'm sure you never thought of. And it's going to put things in such different light that you probably never thought of this before. This person said to me as follows. He said that from January until the beginning of September, there were over 500 road casualties in Israel. That means, you know, one of the most dangerous roads to drive on is in Israel. There were over 500 fatalities on the roads in Israel. 2015 was becoming the record year. More people were dying, and if the trend would continue till the end of December, more people would have died on the highways in Israel than since 1948, since the beginning of the state. That's what he said. Once this intifada terrorist began, less people went on the roads. There were more roadblocks. There were more police. He says, in the last 30 days, no one died. So he said to me, listen to this, he said. He said, in a normal month in September, there could have been 60 deaths. Because of this intifada, there were only 15. Where actually 45 more people are alive than before. That means the intifada stuff has saved 45 Jewish lives. Hmm. Now that's a shocking statement. How? That's a shocking statement. He says, you know, why does God do what he does? How does God control the world? Why does God pick and choose? And the answer is, we don't know. But one thing's for sure, we don't know how the world runs. Because what this guy is saying is, the real enemy is ourselves. We, 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 are, we are killing more Jews than they are. And because they acted crazy, it changed the whole attitude on the roads. There are probably 45 people alive now in October that would have been dead. So it really makes us wonder, you know, you know we don't understand the world. That's the first thing he said. The Ooh. second thing he said was, oh, oh, what? I'm sorry, who said it? This was someone, I, I, I was speaking to a Rav in, in, in Queens, and someone, he was speaking to a, an Israeli politician or someone from Zaka was, say, was saying this. The second thing he said was also very, very fascinating to understand. He said, you may not remember this. I said this last night in the shir, and people remembered it. And I'm going to say, Shabbos, someone was going to show me the article. 
in the beginning of September, end of August, beginning of September, there was an Israeli soldier, I think a Mizrahi type, a little bit more modern Israeli soldier, who was in Mei Sharim, and he wanted to find the place, I think, the Dava Mincha. And I don't know if you remember, he was beaten up. You know, some people remember the story. I, don't, I didn't remember the story, but when I said it in the Shir a day ago, in the last two days, I've been saying this over, they said, yeah, we, we remember the article. He was beaten up. They came out, you know, what are you doing? Why are you joining the army? Shade of me, you know, the, the draft, it's wrong. They beat him up. He says, today, if you go to May Shadim, there's soldiers everywhere. And what's happening? Women are coming and saying, hey, listen, I baked some cookies. Would you like some cookies? I baked a cake. Here's a piece of cake. You must be thirsty. Here, have a cup of, of water. Here's a, have a cup of coffee. So he said, two months ago when the soldier was in Meir Sharim, they beat him up. Who beat him up? Arabs? No. Jewish. The Hasidic community of Meir Sharim. What are you doing to soldier in Meir Sharim? Get out of here. We don't want soldiers. Uh, why? Why? Because they, you know, you want to draft the yeshiva boys. And now there are soldiers by the bus stops and by the yeshiva, and, they, and they're, not only are they not cursing them, they're blessing them, thank you for coming, have some cake, have some coffee. Encouraging. Why they change? Why? Because you don't read a newspaper? And because they're safe. You don't want to get killed. Huh? Is that Intifada? They don't want to get killed. Right. There was a, a stabbing in, in Gaula, right there in, in the heart of Meishari. There was a stabbing. So he says, you know, you ask, why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Because we don't connect the dots. We don't put one plus one. Before Rosh Hashanah, we think we're such big tzaddikim. We see a soldier, oh, it's terrible, chiloni, oh, get out of here. We're going to beat you up. So Hashem says, really? That's how Jews act? Jews to Jews. You don't need the soldier. You think you're so good. You think you're so safe. Let me give you a little knock. We'll see how <laughs> safe you are. All of a sudden, you're not so safe anymore, are you? So he said, two things. You know, you ask why. You think you know how to run the world. You think you know all the pluses and minuses. You think you understand everything. You understand nothing. There are more people alive today because of the Intifada than there wouldn't be because the roads are safer. <laughs> and there's more appreciation for, what's, for Israel as a state because you realize that you are in a hostile environment. He says, so maybe that's what God, maybe that was the lessons God taught us. Painful and innocent lives are lost and no one excuses that. And there's no excuse for the violence. There's no excuse for any of that. But a Jew has to look at the picture, and then he has to see what is not quickly noticeable. He has to go beyond the picture. And beyond the picture is what I just told you. So I found that to be very, very interesting. Okay. There's, we know that in the entire book of Bereshit, there are three mitzvot. The first mitzvah is Peruvu, have children. The second mitzvah is Brit Milah. And the third mitzvah is Gir Hanosha. There are three mitzvahs. So there's a sefer that's, that came out about a year ago. I have it. It's called Otzer Pelos HaTorah. They only have two volumes out. They have Bereshit and Shemot. And I've prepared for every... I've, I'm a year ahead, so I've been... Some of the things I told you last week and the week before came from this sefer. When I told you about shame and I told you about... Mm -hmm. Gan Eden, I told you all about, you know, the Gilgulim of Noah, his Moshe, and Yosef, it all came from in here. So he has over here a few things for this week I want to share with you, then we're going to go back into some of the regular stuff. He says that there's a Gemara, a famous Gemara in Yavomus. The Gemara in Yavomus says that if a person is married for 10 years and doesn't have children, no. get divorced. he has the right, he can if he wants to divorce yeah. his wife, mm -hmm. but he has to give her the Ketubah. Okay? Now, you have to understand the Gemara is talking about before science. Now we have science. Well, get. What? Get. He can give her a get because he hasn't had children with her. So then the Gemara says, but that's only if you're married to her for 10 years in Israel. Mm. But if you're married in Chutz it doesn't count. Why? Because in Chutz 
there's no, there's like it's an Aveira, it's a sin to live in Chuslaret, and therefore the sin prevented you from having children. He says, we know that from Avraham Avinu, because Avraham Avinu was married to Sarah for many, many years. Never had to divorce her. Travels to Israel when he's 75. Waits 10 years. Now he's 85. Doesn't have children, so he thinks about Hagar and everything else. So why now? Because he was living 10 years in Israel. So we see that it only counts the 10 years in Israel. Doesn't apply to Chuslaretz. The, the Rosh, the Rosh says, I disagree with that. He says, because we see many people in Chuslaretz have children. So if nobody in Chuslaretz had children, I understand. Yeah. What do you mean? But many people in Chuslaretz have children. So therefore, he says, I don't think it makes a difference. Israel, not Israel, outside of Israel, 10 years, you have the right to, to ask for a divorce. The other of course, you can talk about it back and forth, but it doesn't necessarily apply today when you have science. Because it's possible that through science you can figure out that the problem is not the, husband, the, the wife. Could be the wife could have children. Problem could be the husband. I had a couple that did not have children, and they, they decided to get divorced, and it, it, it turned out to be a very bitter divorce. I don't know what happened. It turned out a very, very bitter divorce. He got married, and she got married. He had children, and she had children. So when they got married to somebody else, they had children. Both of them got cancer, and both of them died. Wow. Like, you know, whoa. Like, this is, you have to see these people's lives, and you say to yourself, what happened here? This was a mess from start to finish. A mess from start to finish. When they were married, they never had the schus to have children. Never. How long then? 10 years? They were married 10 years, 12 years. And then they started blaming each other and, and, and attacking each other. In the end, they just walked away, they got divorced, and they both again got remarried, both had children. And then they both got cancer, and they both died. Young? Yeah. So, like, you know, it was like Hashem's judgment. You could see the Yad Hashem in that judgment. Tikkun. This may be Tikkun. It could be. It could be. It's impossible to know. Okay. So, you know, it says it says that uh, clearly we need to to go through that a little bit and figure out what he can do. He brings down over here, for example, when we talked about when Avram took the gifts from uh, the the king of Mitzrayim. Are you allowed to take gifts from a non-Jew? He talks about are you allowed to take gifts from a non-Jew? So again, he, he brings down. He says that if you owe people money, you can take gifts from a non-Jew. If you're doing a job or a service, you're allowed to charge. There's no iser in, in doing a service, doing you know things for a non-Jew. Then he brings down the famous story in Reish, you know, in this in the sefer over here. I just want to find out. He, he brings down the famous story uh, that you probably heard the story. I, I've heard it. If you ever go to the city of Hebron, where the Morat Hamachpela is. There is a shul there called the Beit Knesset of Avraham Avinu. The shul of Avraham Avinu. Of course, you have to understand that there was never a shul during the days of Avraham Avinu. There was no Beit Knesset during the days of Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu lived in, in Beersheba. Um, he really didn't live. He lived outside of Hebron, maybe in Be'elone, Moe, but he didn't necessarily live in Hebron. There was no shul that he built. But it was called the Beit Knesset of Avraham Avinu. And the story goes that there was one Erev Yom Kippur that, you know, that this community, many people left for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. On Erev Yom Kippur, they thought they would have ten people, they only had nine. So it's Erev Yom Kippur, they want to daven Kol Nidre, they want to daven Arvit, and there's only nine people. And all of a sudden, an older gentleman walks in, they have ten, and he's there, and they daven, you know, the nighttime and the daytime, he's there for the entire Yom Kippur, it's a beautiful davening. Then after Yom Kippur is over, everybody starts going home to eat. They look for this guy to invite him over for a meal. He's gone. He disappeared. Finally, the, the rabbi had a dream that night, and he, and he heard in a dream that the person who came for their minyan was Avraham Avinu mm -hmm. to make the minyan. So since that story, that particular shul, and it's still there today. I've davened there. I've gone there. I have pictures of it. It's called the Beit Knesset of Avraham Avinu because he joined that minyan. Now, there's a Gomorrah in Ksuvis. 
The Gemara in Suva says that Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, he's the author of the Mishnah. He wrote all the Mishnah. So they bring out a lot of stories about him. I, not only is it in the Gemara, but I also, I'm doing Yerushalmi, and in the Yerushalmi that I'm doing, Kalayim, in the back, in the last pack, chapter of Kalayim, it brings out all the different stories of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. I'll give you an example. When Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was sick, was going to die, he left instructions that the bottom of his coffin, they should drill holes. So when they put the coffin in the ground, the dirt of Eretz Yisrael should touch him. Because of that, we have the custom today, many times, to drill holes in the bottom of coffins. We have the custom today that we, we spread a little bit of the dirt of Eretz Yisrael in the coffin. So there's the, the Gemara goes through all the different things that happened before he died, and what we learned from it, and a lot of it we do today. So the Gemara says that after he died, he used to come back every Erev Shabbat to make Kiddush for his family. Mm. Now that's pretty scary, right? You know, it's Friday night, you're sitting Shiva, the wife and the children are asking who's going to come and say Kiddush, and all of a sudden there's, you look at the dining room table, and there at the yeah. table, at the and end of the table, you, you is, he's his papa, he's, is, you know, he's, he's, whatever, whatever he looked, and he's making Kiddush for you. And he did this week after week for months, until a neighbor came by Friday night to borrow something. And the servant at the door said, Sorry, I can't let you in. Uh, Rebbe is making Kiddush right now for the family. <laughs> so the minute Rebbe heard that people were finding out about this, he disappeared. He, disappeared. he stopped coming. <laughs> That's what the Gemara says. Then the, there's another Gemara. The Gemara says that Rabbi Yossi Haglili used to come back every Motsoi Shabbat and make Habdullah for his family, even after he died. Because his wife didn't have anybody to make Havdolo, so he used to make Havdolo. And that happened for quite a while until also he stopped and he wouldn't come anymore. So they ask the question and they say, listen, we know that, for example, a person dies, we bury them in a talit. But because they're not chayev in mitzvot, we make the talit posul. So if, you, if, you're, if you're dead, you don't have to do mitzvot. So if you don't have to do mitzvot, how can you make kiddush? How can yeah. you make Havdolo? Yeah. You don't have Shabbos, you don't have any you know, your potur. So what does he bring down? I think from the Chido, only the Chido could give this answer. Mm -hmm. The Chido says, we have a rule. Tzadikim, even when they're dead, they're, alive. they're considered alive. So if they're considered alive, then, then they're chayev and everything, therefore they can, do what, they can do everything. So that's what he said. He says that they're Tzadikim, you know, I feel it in Misasa, Nikra Chaim. So he, he has a lot of things over here, you know, from the from the chida, which is where I, I get because I don't have the, all this form of the chida, but I got a lot of it from here. He has a question over here that he brings out also from the chida. He says, "Who did the Brit Milan of Rome Avinu?" So one opinion is himself. Okay, one opinion is Hashem. One opinion is Hashem was the Mohel. One opinion he himself was the Mohel. There is an opinion. And the, uh, it's brought down that Hashem sent a scorpion. And the scorpion did the Brit Milah, or the scorpion helped Avram Avinu do the Brit Milah. And they bring some Pasuk and Rayas and Roshay Tevos that the scorpions did it. Pirke the Rabbi Eliezer. There's a sefer called Pirke the Rabbi Eliezer from Rabbi Eliezer Agotel. He brings down in Perechoftes that shame ben Noach, Noach's son, shame, yeah, was a Moel, and he did the Brit Milah on Avraham and Ishmael. Wow. Now remember we said last week that shame lived to be a long, long time. He had eaten from the eighth Hachaim, so he, he lived a long, long time. Does it say over there that he made the first Brit Milah until 313 men? And then, then he did it to himself. Does he bring he, that to him? he talks a little bit about that, and that he did everybody that was there, you know, and, and, and he talks about that some of them didn't survive. A lot of them didn't survive, and he goes back and forth. And he says, when did the Brit Milah take place? One opinion it says it took place on Yom Kippur. Right, so yeah, that's when he made the Brit Milah. Yeah, that's what the Pirkei the and the same thing says, Shehoya Zeb Yom Kippurim. You know, and that's why, you know, in Tazriyah Mitzorah, right before Achim Mos Kedoshim, it talks about 
in the mitzvah of Brit Milah, because it connects it to Yom Kippur. Then he asked the question, who was the Sandik? Oh, Sandak. Yeah, who was who the Sandak? <laughs> what? Hashem. So one opinion, one opinion was again Hashem. Hashem was the Sandak. That's the that's the fallback position. When you don't have the answer, Hashem is the Sandak, Hashem was the Moil, everything else. He says that the Sandak was Mamre. Mamre was his friend. Remember, he had asked, uh, honor uh, Eshkel Mamre, uh, three, and they three, all three, told him, no, it? no, yeah. no. Mamre says, do yes, it. If do. Hashem says to do it, you do it. Yeah. So Hashem says, oh, that's very nice. You can be the Sandak. Wow. So there's an opinion that says, She Mamre Hoya Sandak. Because he gave Avram Avinu the advice to do the Brit Milah, and therefore he should do it. Okay? Uh, he bring down the Akhadish Brochu, Hoya Sandish al Avram Avinu. So there's all, all different opinions as to who the, the Sandak was. So there's, it's interesting. You know, we take a lot of things for granted. Now, in the olden days, what did they use to do a Brit Milah? They used a sharp stone. Stone? A stone. Wow. That's no what, I, no that's metal. What I, that's what I said on for Shabbos for all the people, that that's what he used. That's what we see even Tzipporah used. That's what used yeah. When did it change? When did it change from David a stone Amelech. to a knife? David HaMelech. David HaMelech. When by David HaMelech? When he killed the... So David HaMelech was going to fight Goliath, yeah. and he took a stone. But the Goliath had a helmet on, it was metal. So David prayed that the metal should open up and let the stone through. And the metal said, why? What's in it for me? So David said, if you do this, I will I'll, I'll encourage people to use metal to do Brit Milah. Wow. David was very... <laughs> this is in the Miam Loez. If you look in the Miam Loez, in the story of Goliath, which yeah. is in Shmuel, he brings out this whole story. He talks about the stones and the type of stones and the names that he wrote on it. But once the, he killed Goliath, from that day on, David and Melech passed the rule that we now use a metal knife to do Brit Milah. Wow. But, Until uh, then, it was a stone. It's good but for I us. know about the hood. Hmm? It's, it's, good for us. it's better for us. <laughs> yeah. What? Shem asked for uh, Shalom Melech, tell to God, I'm tired, stay for that world. And he, he I said that last week. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not here. I know. <laughs> but we talked about that Shem had, had lived so long because he ate from the eight Hachayim, from the Tree of Life, and he asked Shlomo Amelech, please, I'm tired, let me die. And Shlomo Amelech, I'm sorry. That was one of the things we said I've last week. I've never heard that, I'm sorry, my brother. Knives from stone is, could be sharp? Sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Really? I have put stones in my pond and I've cut myself. Wow, many times. Yeah, many times I've cut myself. But scorpion just uh, jalet on you. So someone said that. Someone said that maybe the purpose of the scorpion was like an anesthe anesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. And it gave a little sting that numbed the area, which made it easier for Avram to do the Brit Milah because ah. he was scared. Right. Ah. I have a book, astrology book, with 12, 12 zodiacs. Right. And one of the private bodies of the person is called the scorpion. It's Scorpio, scorpion. yes. Maybe what you no, tell no, no. for anesthesia. That's no, no, it. No, you yeah. got it, right? The, the feet are like the fish. Right. The hands are like the, uh, so to speak, the, the uh, Gemini. So the, bo the bodies is like Libra. The two... Uh, Correct. Sh 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 so uh, the, the, whole, the whole structure. And the, the whole structure and of a person is based person, on the... On the Correct. Zodiac, and that part is called the scorpion. Maybe that means to that... Area. Area. I, I work many... That's what he talks about. And he brings oh, down and he brings oh, down... Oh, you know, he talks about that, the scorpion. I, I it's unusual work, to yeah. say a scorpion did a Brit Milah. Right, right, right. Yeah, I worked many years in the cemetery, and many times the scorpion, uh, what, it bite me. Yeah, yeah, but right. I found, it's 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 yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Right. but his hand is not cut nothing. Right. right, so it could be that's exactly what it was. It was done yeah. for that reason. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is from the, the Mesha Chochmah. Let's understand what it says yeah, over here. Yeah. So I mentioned to you that there were three mitzvot, and Brit Milah was one of them. Now, the Gemara says, the famous Gemara, Shem ben Gamliel says, any mitzvah that the Jews accepted the simcha is done by simcha. Mm -hmm. Any mitzvah that the Jews accepted not so happy is often not done by simcha. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting mitzvahs that they were not happy with 
was when Moshe said who you could marry, who you could not marry. Oh. There were restrictions, right? You couldn't marry certain family members. So since then, the Gemara says there's never a, a marriage that during the arrangement there's not a fight. Now, ain't ksuva asha ain't katata. There's no ksuva that doesn't have an argument with it. And very often when people get engaged, we always we give them the bracha, you should make the simcha with simcha. That means there's often such tension in the argue over the caterer, over which flowers to use, who pays for what. You know, there's always machlokit. Mm-hmm. So we always give them a bracha. They should make the simcha with simcha. Because since the beginning of time, when Moshe told them who you can marry, you cannot marry, they were unhappy. But Dovah Melech says, I was so happy when I got your commandment about Brit Milah. Famous Gemara with Dovah Melech, he was once in the bathhouse, and he felt scared, he had no mitzvot, and he wasn't wearing his seat or anything. And he remember, no, I'm not without a mitzvah, I have my Brit Milah, I'm always having a mitzvah with me. So, they bring down over here, again from the Pirkei the Rabbi Eliezer. The Pirkei the Rabbi Eliezer says, Vayas Avroam Mishta Godol B'yom Higomel Yitzchak. Simple pshat. Avroam Avinu made a big party when Yitzchak became independent. Usually, Higomel means when a child turns two, when they're no longer nursing. Some people say, no, Avroam Avinu threw the party at the Brit Milah of Yitzchak. Some people ask, why didn't he throw a party at his own Brit Milah? Well, the truth is, he suffered. He was in pain on his own Brit Milah. Uh, we know that on the third day of his Brit Milah, he did throw a party for a bunch of angels who came and, and wanted something to eat. But, you know, the, the, the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer says something fascinating. Again, in that paragraph, when he talks about Brit Milah, he says the word Higomel is spelled Hey Gimel Mem Lamed. Hey is five, Gimel is three, is eight. Mol, Mem, Lamed, is Mila. So he says, on the day of Yitzchak's Brit Mila, the word Higomel <coughs> means he threw a party on day eight of the circumcision. Mm. So he says it's a remez that he threw a party on the day that he gave, he did the Brit Mila on Yitzchak. Now that was the only person who got a Brit Mila. Meaning as follows. Abraham had a Brit Mila when he was 100, 99. Yitzchak had a Brit Mila when he was 8. Yaakov was born already, you know, with a Brit Mila, he didn't need one, and Esau wouldn't let. Because when Esau was born, he was very red, and they were afraid, and as he got older, he wouldn't let. So the one of the Avot, of the, of the three Avot, the only one who had a Brit Mila on the eighth day was Yitzchak. Okay? He's the only one. Avram didn't, Ishmael didn't, of course, Yaakov didn't need, and Esau didn't let. Who born with the already? Yaakov. Yaakov. Yaakov was born already with a Brit Milah. It can happen. Today, the halacha is you still draw some blood from the side, you know, but, you know, they say Moshe Rabbeinu was born with a, a Brit Milah. You know, Adam was, not, was born with a Brit Milah. The Priya was not done during the Ramadan, right? I don't know. Sometimes, you see, to, in the Sorry. older days, they used to do the cut the Orla and did the Priya by hand. Yeah. Now we cut both. We don't even do the Priya that much. Uh-huh. They, can, they, they pull with a you know, right. they, they, with a clown, they pull out both. So he brings down, Rashwab says, that it says, Kimotse Sholoro. Motse means I find something as if by accident. Sholo means booty, I fought for it and I won. So he says that since Brit Bila was given in Lech Lecha, before the Torah was given, many non Jews could think that the, that mitzvah belongs to them also. So when Dovah Melech says, Kemot Seisholorov, that only Jews were doing Brit Milah. The Goyim stopped doing Brit Milah during Dovah Melech's time. He says, wow, it's like we won a war and we walked away with a prize. The prize was one more mitzvah on our side. That means it was never included in the mitzvahs of Sheva mitzvahs of B'nai Noach. So it was considered something that was in his, something you know, taken as a, as a special gift, as a special prize. Even though, the, that's what the Meshach Chochmah says, even though Brit Milah was given before Matan Torah, it was still something that was done before. Okay? Let's go a little further. I want you to listen to this, and we have to understand what this says. We go through the Pasha a little bit more, and there's a battle. Right? There's a battle of five kings and four kings. Logic says that if you have four kings fighting five kings, 
the five kings should win. More men, more armies, more conquer. That didn't happen. The four kings were very powerful. They included Nimrod, they included quite a few very, very powerful uh, uh, countries. And as a consequence, the five kings lost, which means Sodom, Amora, Adma, Tzvoim, all those cities fell, all those countries fell, and Lot was taken captive. Okay, this is going to be interesting. You have to listen to this very carefully. Who comes running to tell Avraham that Lot was taken captive? Og. Og. The old, the future Og, Melech Abosha, one of the giants. Og comes. On one hand, his motive wasn't very pure. What was he hoping? Avraham would go and fight and get killed, and Sarah would be available to him. Why Sarah would marry him, I don't know. Uh, he must have been old, because they say Og was in the time of Noah. So it wasn't as if he was a young guy and Sora was an old lady. He was probably much older than Sora, so maybe he had a plan. Moshe was worried. Even hundreds of years later, Moshe was worried that maybe, even though Og's motive was not pure, but he still did a good thing. And therefore, maybe that schut will, will, will help him out. And therefore, uh, he was worried to, to fight against Og. But Hashem said, don't worry. Now, how did Og get his name? What does Og mean? Rashi says it comes from the word Uga. So Rashi says he came around Pesach time when they were making Ugos matzos. Ugos matzos means cakes, cakes of matzo. But what is an Uga? In Hebrew, what is an Uga? It's a cookie. It's a cookie. An Uga is a cake or cookie. They say that if he was a giant, he was the original cookie, mm-hmm. cookie monster. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Old Melech and, and he came to Sesame Street, no doubt. <laughs> okay, so look what happened over here. Anyway, it says, Vayovo ha-polit, and Avram is in Elone Mamre, and he's there with honor Eshko, all his buddies, and he hears that Lot was taken captive. Vayorek es chani beso. So he organizes an army. He's going to organize a group of men to fight. How many men does he take? How many men does he pull together? 318. 318. And he lives in Seoul. Shemona Osar, Adan, And he begins the pursuit. Not a very big army, right? It may look like a big army, but 318 men are not a lot. Now, Rashi, usually, when given the choice to say the simple answer, the simple interpretation, or the more complicated, what does Rashi always do? Simple. Rashi is there to make things simple. Rashi is always simple. What does Rashi say? Rashi says the 318 was not 318 men. It was only one person. Eliezer. Why? Because Eliezer is Gematria 318. Now, why does Rashi say that? It's a question we need to understand. Why not leave it 318? Why change 318 to be one person, make it even crazier? Then it says, they fought all night. Rashi says, no. It doesn't say all night. It says half the night. So Rashi says that the night was cut in two. The first half, Hashem did a miracle for Avraham. Avraham won the war. But the second half, he didn't need the, the miracle. So Avraham Avinu says, you know, you owe me half a night of miracles. So Hashem says, don't worry, I'll pay you back. You know when? Egypt. In Egypt. Because uh-huh. in Egypt, the Makat Bechorot happened in the middle of the night. The second half of the night, where they killed all the Egyptian firstborns and they left Mitzrayim, that was Bishchut Avraham Avinu. Because back then, when he fought, I, off, I gave him... Uh, permission for a full night of miracles and he only needed half the night. Mm-hmm. Like it's a bizarre Rashi. I mean, it's really crazy. You mean, telling me that, you know, you, Hashem promised him a full night, only gave him half a night. So it seems a little bit unusual. So there's a Rabbeinu Bachai. Have you ever heard the Sefer Rabbeinu Bachai? Yeah. Famous Sefer Rabbeinu Bachai. So Rabbeinu Bachai gives a very interesting answer. He says, when Avraham Avinu organized his men, it was 318 men. And they start going out, they're going to be ready to fight. But what's the halacha? 
what's the law? In, in, in the Torah, before you went out to war, what happened? The Kohen or the general came up and gave a speech. Mm-hmm. What was the speech? If anybody got engaged and didn't get married, go home. If anybody built a house and didn't dedicate it, go home. If anybody built a, a plant in a vineyard, a field, and didn't cut it, go home. And then he says, if anybody has Averos, if you're afraid, you spoke Lashon Hara, you didn't daven with Kavana, you spoke during davening, you even spoke between putting on your tefillin of the hand into the head, go home. So, Avraham Avinu gave a speech. And he gave that speech. Everybody went home. <laughs> Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says there's only one guy left. <laughs> Eliezer. So he says, that's why Rashi says what he said. He says, Avraham started off with 318, that's true. But he gave a speech, you know. Rabbi shouldn't give speeches. He gave a speech. <laughs> and the speech, he scared everybody. Everybody got scared. Everybody started to leave. They didn't want to die. And he was left with one person, Eliezer. So Avraham Avinu said, ah, okay, I had yesterday 318. I still have 318. Eliezer is Gematria 318. That's what uh, Rabbi Nubachai says. But it's interesting. In Parsha Shoftim, it says, Ki If you go out to war against your enemies, and you see horses and chariots, I'm covering my own, a very big army. Lo sira mihem, don't be afraid for them. Ki Hashem alokecha imcha, Hashem is with you. Hamal chomeris Yisrael, who took you out of Mitzrayim. What's that mean? It means that I did miracles in the olden days. But sometimes I gave more of a miracle than you needed. So there's leftover. If there's leftover, you can cash in on it even now. Which is what happened with the other half of the night. Okay. Then I heard it was very interesting. Uh, the following scenario. Listen to this. What is the, one of the worst fears? What, what, if you're leading an army into battle... One of the worst things that could happen is if, the, if, you're, if your men are afraid that they see an army ten times the size, right? They become afraid that they're going to, they panic. It's called panic. They're going to die, yeah. They're going to die. In Hebrew, what's the Hebrew word for panic, for, for feeling depressed, for, uh-huh. for giving up hope? Uh-huh. Pachad is one word, that's fear. Yeah. There's something called yish, oh, giving, up hope. giving up hope. If, for example, you lose money, mm-hmm. and you give up hope ever finding the money, mm-hmm. you are miyayesh, yish. Mm-hmm. Yish is yud alev vav shin. You know what the gematria of yish 317. is? Three hundred and seventeen. Not eighteen, seventeen. Seventeen. So Avraham Avinu said. Logic says we are fighting a hopeless battle. There's no way we can win. But you know what? Giving up is 317. So I'm going to go out with 318. It means I don't give up. One above Yehush means I don't give up. So he went with 318 people to show I don't give up. And when those 318 abandoned him, he said, I have no problem. Because Eliezer is Gematria 318. Then, listen to this. Where do we have the name Eliezer in the Torah? Besides over here, who named their kid Eliezer? His father was the king. Moshe Rabbeinu, Uh right? He named his his kid Eliezer. Ki elokei ovi b'ezri, Hashem save me, for Yatsileni, he saved me, Mecherev Paro. What was the story? What's the story that Hashem saved him from the sword of Paro? What's, this, what's the story? Do you remember the story? Paro caught Moshe Rabbeinu. He killed an Egyptian. The punishment is death. So he got the executioner, and the executioner got an axe. And what was the executioner going to do? He was going to chop off his head. And what happened to his neck, to Moshe Rabbeinu's neck? Hard, like it turned like marble. So now let's take a picture. You're Moshe Rabbeinu. You're standing there. Your hands are tied, whatever it is. The executioner, a big guy, mm-hmm. 
takes a sharp axe and is a, and wheels it and, and starts flying. What do you think your chances are of surviving? I mean, would you sell this guy a life insurance policy? Zero. I don't think so. Ain't so Right? Ain't so ain't. It's game over. Right? It's over. That's it. Finished. And then his neck turns to marble and the axe goes ding. And according to some, the axe came back at the guy and, and, and he killed the executioner. And Moshe runs away. So what does he call his kid? Eliezer! Why? Because Eliezer is 318. Never I had given up. It was a mistake. Always wait till the end. You know, I have a saying in my office. It, it, it always gets better in the end. If it's not better, you're not at the end yet. <laughs> I have a saying like that in my office. I have it on my desk, on the side of my desk. If you ever come to my library, I have it. You know? Everything it says everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end. But it was not found for <laughs> wife for the Isaac Abeno, yes? Right. In the beginning. What? Eliezer found for that, well, that's, that's next, next week. That's next, two next weeks. Parasite, yeah. We're not there yet. But so, he's found yet. So Eliezer. No, he didn't. Uh, Rome sent him with a, with a message, yeah. with a mission. So Moshe calls his son Eliezer because I had given up. And that was a mistake. I should not give up. Okay? There's a famous Gemara. Listen to this Gemara. It's a Gemara in Brochus Daf Yud. The Gemara in Brochus Daf Yud says, By Yomi Mahem in those days, Chizkiyo HaMelech got sick. You know that Chizkiyo HaMelech was very sick. Why did he get sick? Because he didn't want to get married. Why did he want to get married? Because he was going to have a son or a Russia. Because he saw that he was going to have a son or a Russia. Okay? So, By Yovo Elav Yeshaya Ben Omaz Hanovi. The Navi Yeshaya, Yeshaya Anavi comes to him. Now Yeshaya Anavi is a very powerful Navi. Yeah, give me the, your daughter. Vayomer, he says to him, Ki meis I have a message to you from Hashem. You're going to die and you're not going to live. What does that mean? Of course I'm, gonna die, I'm not going to live. So the Gemara says, Ki meis ato, you're going to die in this world, and you're not going to get Olam Haba either. So you're going to get a double whammy. You're going to die now, and you're not going to get Olam Haba. Wow. Because you don't make children. And he says, why? He says, because you didn't get married. You didn't have children. He says, but I'm going to have a child who's a Russia. So he says to him, that's not your business. Oh. You take care of your job. You take do the mitzvahs. Hashem takes care of the world. Don't try to run the world. <laughs> Navua is not your business. So then, Chizkiyo says, no problem, I'll, I'll dive into Hashem and uh, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to fix this. <laughs> so Yeshayo Hanavi says to him, he says to him, didn't you hear me? You can't fix this. You can't fix this. Kfar nigzra lecha gezeira. It's already been decreed. That's it. It's over. In Shemaim, Hashem wrote out the gezeira stamped it, posted it, it's done. You cannot fix this. Can't change it. Can't change it. Omar Lay, Ben Amot, he said, you know, by calling him by his father's name, you know, Rabinowitz, you know, Ben Amot. Kala Nevuascha, have you finished your Nevua? Did you, are you finished? He said, yeah. Say, get out. Wow. Told you Shaya Novi. Wow. <laughs> Why? I have a Kabbalah for my great-great-grandfather. They say, who was that great-great-grandfather? They say, Dovod HaMelech. But it really is from Moshe Rabbeinu. Oh. Listen to what he said. Even if the sword, which is sharp, is right by your neck. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. You know why? Because you never know when your neck turns to marble and the sword goes flying the other way and kills the guy who's trying to kill you. <laughs> so he said to Yeshaya, don't tell me it's too late. There's no such thing. And what happened? He got better. And he lived 15 more years. And he, had, he got married to Yeshaya's daughter. And he had a son, Menashe, which was not the greatest. You know. Two children. But, but... You fixed it. You fixed it. Why? 
because a Jew does not give up. There's no such thing as giving up. You don't give up. But how many people being, being in this world not being married and, uh, and so on? Is it considered that the same case as Hizkiyah. No, because did not married. want to get married. The other people want to get married. Maybe they haven't found the right person, but they're making the Ishtadlus to forget married. Why he didn't want So if a person made the Ishtadlus, that considers he got as he was making Correct. It's not the, not the same, because you're not as miserable as the rest of us, so you still have to keep working. No, but it's, <laughs> it's not the same, but keep trying. One day want, you'll, you'll make he, it. Why didn't he want to, to get married? Because he saw Benavua wow. that he would have a son who would be a big Russia. And he didn't want to bring that son into the world. Yeah. And his son was Menashe. And in his days, the Beit HaMikdash was the sign to destroy the Beit HaMikdash in his days. Wow. Okay. One last thing is one minute left. Uh, I also saw this in, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting Gemara in Sukkah. One last thing. The Gemara in Sukkah brings down that a certain lady, how he is a Savta, this uh, old lady, uh, 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 what? This Babishka, a, a, a grandmother, came to Rav Nachman, who was the Reish Galusa, and he, she said, you know what, you and all the rabbis, the Sukkah you're sitting in is Pasul, because it's stolen. Huh. So Rav Nachman says, what do you mean it's stolen? He says, well, the Sukkah was built with a beam, a big beam. That beam was from my house. Hmm. Your guys took it. They didn't buy it from me. They just took it. Hmm. I want my beam back. And if you don't give me my beam back, the sukkah you're sitting in is not kosher because it's stolen. That's what the Gemara says. Hmm. Well, they have to get money. So Rav Nachman says there's a gzera that if you have to destroy something in order to make it easier, you're allowed to pay the person. So here, here's your 20 bucks. You don't get your beam back. What does the lady say? The lady says to Rav Nachman, Do you know who my father was? My father had 318 servants serving him. I want my bean back. <laughs> like, who cares who your father is? And he had 318 ser servants? Big deal. Why should you get your bean back? So Rav Tzadak HaKohen, the famous Rav Tzadak HaKohen, he says something very fascinating. He says, who was the father she was referring to was Avraham Avinu. Mm. And he had 318 servants. You know what 318 means? I don't give up. No yish. Oh. So she's saying is, you think I gave up on my beam. I, my father is Avraham Avinu. He had 318. He never gave up. And I don't give up either. I want my beam back. <laughs> That's what Reb Tzadik HaKohen said. You know what Reb Nachum said there? That's very nice, you have a wonderful family, but all you're going to get is the 20 bucks. <laughs> That's it, you're going to get the 20 bucks. You know, it, it, it's just interesting that the, the idea is, a Jew doesn't give up. Until the end, Yeshua Hashem can terrify. That's the lesson you learn from Avraham Avinu. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much.